Well, good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us at City on the Hill Church this morning. We're glad that you've logged on, and we pray that you will open your heart and worship the Lord with us, and we pray that you'll receive the Word of God. We believe that yokes are destroyed because of the anointing of God, and we believe that yokes, bondages, afflictions are going to be destroyed in your life today through the ministry of the Word of God and the worship today. So set your faith for that and believe with us today. In the name of Jesus. We're so glad you're here. Let's worship the Lord today. Praise God. You're in the light of fire. What makes us come alive? A sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill. Surrender to your will. Your glory.
people that their states are still on lockdown and and that just the mental uh, anxiety that they're dealing with not being able to get out not being able some of them not even being able to travel across the, the state or across the town to visit loved ones and family and uh, many many believers not allowed to even gather and worship God in their churches at this point Let's pray right now. Would you agree with me? Would you believe God with me right now? And let's pray for our brothers and sisters, and let's pray for our nation. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, Father God. We pray that you would move upon the hearts of our leaders, especially those, Lord, that have continued these excessive lockdowns, these excessive shutdowns in their states. Lord, move on their hearts in the name of Jesus. Lord, may freedom come to the people of our nation. May freedom come to the people of God in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray that it would be done peacefully. We pray, Father God, that it would not be done through violence and through protest, but it would be done peacefully in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for believers that have not been allowed to gather in their churches. We pray, Father. In the name of Jesus, that they would be allowed to gather once again, as your word tells us to do. For you said, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And we pray that believers would be emboldened, that pastors would be emboldened in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I know some of them are having to do it already and take a step of, of civil disobedience because of a higher law. And that's your law. Father God, when the law of man comes into conflict with the law of God and the word of God, then as Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. And so, Father, I pray that you give these leaders wisdom and these pastors discernment in the name of Jesus. Father, I'm grateful for our governor here in Georgia who has said churches are essential and churches can open. We're grateful for that, Father. And so, Father, we pray for him that you would bless him and strengthen his hands. And we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that these restrictions and this fear would be lifted off of our nation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for it. We ask for your blessing and your mercy upon our nation, Father. In the name of Jesus, be merciful to us, O Lord, and heal our land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise God. Thank you for agreeing with me and believing with me this morning. Uh, I want to encourage you. I hope you, I hope you have your Bible handy. And uh, either that or, or pull it up on your phone or however you do it. But, it, you know, it's just good to have a, to have a print Bible. I hope, you keep a, I hope you keep a hard copy Bible. I, I, use, I use the Bible on my phone as well, and I think that's great. But uh, there's nothing that takes the place of a, of a print Bible. I had my, my grandson with me on Friday, and... and uh, I picked up my Bible to pack it up. We were heading out. I was taking him back to his parents, and I was headed to the office here. 
And I picked up my Bible and I said, let Poppy get his Bible. And my grandson looked at it and he said, Poppy's Bible. And that made me feel so good. He knew that was Poppy's Bible. I hope you have your Bible today. Uh, we're going to go to Psalm 103 again uh, this morning. And uh, we are going to conclude a message that, that we began last Sunday. Psalm 103, I want to read through the first five verses right now. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We have six benefits that are listed here that the psalmist says that we're not to forget. And we're not, and I think there's two reasons there that God doesn't want us to forget these benefits. Number one, we shouldn't forget them and become ungrateful and just think, oh, well, you know, this, we're, just, uh, we're just to expect this. This is just the way life is. And just become ungrateful for the benefits. We need to appreciate what God has done for us and what he does for us and what he will do for us. But also, the Lord doesn't want us to forget these benefits because he wants us to claim them. If we forget them, then we can't claim these wonderful benefits. So he wants us to be able to claim our benefits. And so we looked at the first three last week. I want to review for just a moment. Number one, it says, who forgives all your iniquities. So number one, the Lord forgives all my iniquities. And I hope you'll declare that and say that over your life. He forgives all my iniquities. And this one is fundamental. This one is foundational to receiving all of the other benefits because forgiveness qualifies us to, to accept and to receive the other wonderful benefits. Forgiveness gives us a standing with God. You know, the paralyzed man that they brought to Jesus, his four friends brought him to Jesus, and, and Jesus looked at the man, and before Jesus said, rise up and walk, rise and be healed, he first said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven you. You know, that's the way it is with us many times. Before we are able to even hear, rise and be healed, before we're able to hear you're blessed and prospered, we need to first hear, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven you. Praise God. The second benefit is this. He heals all my diseases. The forgiveness and healing go hand in hand throughout the Bible. Jesus heals all my diseases just as he forgives all of my sins. There's not one sin that his blood hasn't covered. Thank God. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you glad that there's not one sin that his blood didn't pay for? There's not one exemption. There's not one outstanding case. His blood has covered all of our sin. His blood forgives all of our sin. And Jesus, in his redemptive work, he paid for the healing of every disease, every sickness. There's not one disease, not one sickness that he has not redeemed us from. Praise God. And then the third one we talked about last week is this. He redeems my life from destruction. That word destruction also means corruption. It means the grave. It means a ditch. It means a pit. And it's from the root word that also means ruin. See, Satan wants to ruin your life. He wants to bring ruin to you in your health, in your finances, in your marriage, in your family, and your reputation. But praise God, Jesus redeems my life from ruin. He redeems my life from destruction. This also speaks of divine protection that we can claim. Hallelujah. Satan wants to destroy us. Satan wants to... To, to bring destruction, but Jesus gives us divine protection. He redeems our life from destruction. Praise God. Praise God. Let's go on to the fourth benefit today, and that is this. It says, who crowns you in verse number, in verse number four, or verse number, uh, yes, in verse number four, he says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Praise God. So let's look at this. The word loving kindness in the Hebrew, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, it's the word chesed or chesed, uh, C-H-E-S-E-D, so however you would pronounce that. And it means this, it means kindness, it means favor, it means mercy, and it means covenant faithfulness. Praise God. 
The Bible says here that, that he crowns us. In other words, he heaps it on us. He heaps on us kindness, favor, mercy, and covenant faithfulness. The second word there, it says he crowns me with both loving kindness and tender mercies. The two words that they're uh, the two words in English, tender mercies, are actually one word in the Hebrew, and that's the word rakam. And you have to kind of clear your throat when you speak Hebrew, you know. And it's a and it means great tender mercy, and it literally means as a mother cherishes the fetus. It says it literally means as cherishing the fetus. So just like a mother would cherish. That baby, that new life growing inside of her, that is the, that's the way that God thinks about us. That's his attitude toward us. He crowns us with loving kindness and with tender mercies. Praise God. I want to, I want to deal a little bit more with that first one, with, with loving kindness. Loving kindness, and this is from a commentary, so bear with me as I read a little bit from the commentary right now. Loving kindness means tender and benevolent affection. The Hebrew word chesed uh, is difficult to translate into English because there is no word equivalent in English. The writers use chesed for loving kindness, mercy, steadfast love, and loyal love. Even with all these, the full meaning of the Hebrew word cannot really be conveyed. The crown of loving kindness on the head assures God's continuous love and kindness by which he will not let his people go. Praise God. That means that he will not, he'll not let you go. He'll not let you fall away. He'll not desert you. He'll not forsake you. Praise God. Even when we miss it, even when we fall, even when we come short, if we are his people, if we look to him, he says, I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. You know, the parable of the, the, that Jesus told, the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal son's waywardness could not destroy his father's compassion. It, the, the, the prodigal took the, his father's inheritance and wasted it, went, went through it, and came back destitute, came back with nothing. Half of what his father owned was now gone. But did the father condemn him? No, the father was waiting for him to come home and ran and greeted him and restored him. That's our heavenly father. That's the mercy. That's the loving kindness that he has, that he crowns us with, the psalmist says here. We see this word, chesed, used in the following account in Scripture that you're probably familiar with. And it's the story of David and Mephibosheth. You know, David has become king. Saul was Israel's first king. But now David has become king, and David had made a covenant with Saul's son, Jonathan. And David wanted to honor that covenant, so when he becomes king, he looks around, and he makes this statement in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. He says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Chesed. Loving kindness. Covenant faithfulness. For Jonathan's sake, Mephibosheth hadn't done anything to earn it or to merit it, but David, because he wanted to honor the covenant he made with Jonathan, he said, you know, I want to show kindness to anyone that's left of his house. And so they looked around and they found Mephibosheth. David says, asked again, and the king said, is there still not someone left, someone of the house of Saul, to whom I may show the kindness of God. Again, that's the Hebrew word chesed that we're talking about. And again, in the margin of my Bible there, it says covenant faithfulness. So they find the Phibosheth, son of Jonathan. They bring him to King David, and David looks at him. And we read this in 2 Samuel 9 and verse 7. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. David was going to show favor to Mephibosheth for the rest of his life. In fact, David said, you're going to eat bread from my table continually. You're going to live here in the palace with me. David was going to be, going to be good to Mephibosheth and do good for Mephibosheth 
Why? Because he had made a covenant with Jonathan and, and he was moved by that covenant faithfulness, that loving kindness. Well, it's the same David that wrote and said this in Psalm 103. He crowns me, the Lord crowns me with the same loving kindness. We see this word used also in the book of Lamentations, a passage you may be familiar with. In Lamentations 3 and verse 22, it says, Through the Lord's mercies, there it is again, that Hebrew word, chesed. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Same word that's translated loving kindness in Psalm 103. Here. Because of his mercies over our lives, we're not consumed. Think about that. You know, our bad decisions, life itself, the, the tragedies that can happen in life, we have the loving kindness of the Lord over us, and because of that, we are not consumed. Praise God. Why? Uh, and the, the writer of Lamentations goes on to say, because his compassions fail not. God's compassions fail not. The word compassion there is the is the Hebrew word rakam that we looked at. That's the same word as tender mercies in Psalm 103. He crowns me with loving kindness, that's chesed, and tender mercies, rakam. And we see both these words used in this passage in Lamentations. Through the Lord's mercies, chesed, we are not consumed because his compassions, rakam, fail not. They're new every morning. He says, great is your faithfulness. Praise God. And again, I want to I want to point out that word, uh, that word rakam, that's translated tender mercies in Psalm 103. It means great tender mercy, and it means as cherishing the fetus. But just think about the great love that a mother has for that new life, that baby, that child growing on the inside of her. That's the love that the Lord has for us. That's why abortion goes, goes, such a, goes against the grain of everything that is right and normal and, and good. That goes against the natural, normal love that a mother would have for her child, for her baby. And that's, that's why it is such an abomination. Again, you know, if, any, if there's anyone watching and you've had an abortion, we want you to know this mercy, this love, this kindness that we're talking about. It's available to you. God will show it to you. God will give it to you. He's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. Praise God. But, but this mercy, this kindness, is not just for a period of time, but it's for our future. It's for all of our life. Not just for one day, not just for one season, but all through our lives. The psalm is said in, in, in the 23rd Psalm, in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely, goodness and mercy, that, word, that same word again, Goodness and mercy shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life. Praise God. Let's go back to Psalm 103. And I want to point something else out here. We skip down to verse 13 in Psalm 103. It says this. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And I chose to read out of the New Living Translation for, for this passage because in the New King James and the King James it says the Lord pitieth or pities his children. And to me the word the word pity just doesn't this doesn't work. And when I think of pity, I think of oh, you poor thing. You know, just kind of shaking your head and going tiss, 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 you poor thing. That's really not what uh, certainly not what this word in the Hebrew means. And I like the way it's translated in the New Living Translation. He's tender and compassionate to those who fear him. So think about, think about your children. You love, he, says, he said the Lord is like a father to his children. He's tender and compassionate. Think about the compassion that you have for your children. You only want good for them. You only want the best for them. And you believe the best about your children. Someone has suggested humorously that during this time of the lockdown when the schools were closed and the parents were having to try to finish the, the schooling for their children, 
You know, somebody said, yeah, now you, you know, now you know how the teacher's, you know, t sending home those notes about your kids. You know, they're not, they're not as great as you thought they were, huh? You know, you, know, you get to see them, you know, 24-7. And, you know, that's kind of funny. And we know that our kids aren't perfect. But yet, as parents, we see, we believe the best about our children because we also see something in them. We see, we see the good in them. And thank God, that's the way that God looks at us. He's tender and compassionate toward us, even when we miss it, even when we fail, even when we falter. Why? Because of His tender mercy, because of His kindness, because of His compassion toward us. Hallelujah. This verse goes on, or this passage in verse 14, it says, For He knows, the reason He's tender and compassionate toward us, it says, is because He knows how weak we are. And He remembers that we are only dust. Now, I'm not making excuses for you or for me or for anyone, but folks, we're still human. Even, even when we've been born again and, and, and we preach that side of it and we should, that we've got the life of God in us now, that we're dead to sin, that we're alive to God, that we've got the Spirit of God living in us, the works that Jesus did, we can do also. I believe all of that. And we need to preach that side of it. But you know what? Also, God looks at us and He remembers that we still live in a, in, a, in, a, in a body, in a flesh body. And we're still plagued with the flesh. We're still tempted. We're still tempted to, to get discouraged. We're still tempted to, to want to quit and to give up and to get frustrated. All these things. God knows that. God knows. He's not oblivious to that. He's not standing up there with His arms folded and saying, Now just do better. No, he's, he's tender and compassionate toward us in those times. Praise God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, says this about Jesus. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, Therefore, it was necessary. It was necessary for him, for Jesus, to be made in every respect like us. Think about that. His brothers and sisters. So that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Jesus had to become a man. He had to become human so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. But he also became human in every way, the scripture says here, in every way, so that he could identify with us. So that he could understand when we're tempted, when we're discouraged, when we're frustrated. Jesus knows what that's like. So when you're tempted, when you're frustrated, when you're discouraged, cry out to Jesus. Ask Him to help you. He's not going to say, oh, just toughen up, just be better. He's going to come to you with His mercy, with His grace. That's why the Scripture also says in the book of Hebrews that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain what? Mercy. This mercy, this same mercy that we're talking about. That we may obtain mercy and that we may find grace to help in our time of need. Praise God. He is a merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then it goes on to say in the scripture here, then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people since he himself has gone through suffering and testing. He is able to help us when we are being tested. Praise God. Why? Because he knows what it's like. God became man. Jesus took upon himself flesh in every respect, he knows what it's like to be tempted, to be frustrated, to be discouraged, to want to give up. Praise God. And so when we're, when we're in that place, he can identify with us so we can go to him and he will be merciful to us. He will strengthen us. He will give us grace. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's good news today. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, the last thing, uh, or the last two things, and read if you'd come on back up. The last two things that I want to that I want to cover is this. Uh, the fifth thing it says here: Who satisfies your mouth with good things? Who satisfies your mouth with good things? The New Living Translation says, "He fills my life with good things." The NIV says, "Who satisfies your desires?" with good things. And the New American Standard says it this way, who satisfies your years with good things. 
Bottom line, God is the one who satisfies us. And he gives us good things to satisfy us. To satisfy our desires. To satisfy our years. He fills our lives with good things. See, only God and only the things that God gives can truly satisfy us. We can seek after a lot of things to satisfy us and bring fulfillment. And we find many of those to be hollow, to be insufficient, and some of them are even destructive, as many of us have found out in our lives and in our experience. Oh, but the Lord, He satisfies us with good things. He wants to bring good things, good blessings, spiritual and natural into our lives. And when it's from Him, the Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. From the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, no changing. He doesn't change. He's always good, and He's always giving good gifts. And He fills our life, satisfies my life, satisfies my years, satisfies my desires with good things. Praise God. And then the last one, it says this. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The words, the two words so and that are italicized in the scripture, which means they were added by the translators for clarity. So I think the way that I'm reading it, it's a whole other benefit. It's not just part of the fifth one, but it's actually the sixth benefit. And I want to talk to you about that. He renews my youth like the eagles. Praise God. Now, you know, when I was 25, that didn't mean a lot to me. But now that I'm pushing 59, hey, I'm, I'm starting to claim that one. Yeah, that's becoming more precious to me. He renews my youth like the eagles. Well, in other words, what happens to the eagle, the Lord does for you and for me. Well, what does happen to the eagle? Well, at about five years of age, an eagle will begin to go through what's called a molting process where it loses most of its feathers. Maybe that's what's happened to me. Uh, only to be replaced by new feathers. Glory to God. I'm expecting that miracle. But literally, let, let, me, let me get serious about this. It loses most of its feathers only to be replaced by new feathers. This gives the appearance of renewed youth in the eagle. During this molting process, the eagle will look sickly and weak. But as the process completes... The eagle has the look and feel of renewed strength and energy. And that's what the psalmist says here, that the Lord renews my youth like the eagle. Praise God. God wants to do that. Isaiah, I thought about Isaiah 40 as I read this. Isaiah 40, 29 says this. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I plan on, on running my race and finishing my course strong right to the very end. Because I've got a God, I've got a, a Heavenly Father who renews my youth like the eagle. Praise God. Psalm 92 says it this way. Psalm 92, 13 and 14. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Isaiah 40 says those who wait on the Lord. Psalm 92 says those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Are you planted in the house of the Lord? In His presence? in His Word, in, in fellowship with other believers. If you're planted, then here's what's going to happen. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Praise God. Why? Huh? Because He renews our youth like the eagles. I want to close with this. These... Uh, these scriptures, these blessings, He forgives all 
your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things. And he renews your youth like the eagle. Every one of these are, are communicated in the, in the Hebrew language in what's known as the simple present tense. Simple present tense talks about fixed habits or fixed routines. The behavior are things that will not change. The, the, the present, there's another tense called the present continuous. And it talks about behavior or actions that are happening as we talk at the present time, but will soon end or, or be finished. But this simple present tense is, is something that will never end. I'm so glad that the Bible used all these above benefits or describes them all in the simple present tense. He forgives, he heals, he protects, he redeems, he crowns, he satisfies, and he renews. All these benefits are fixed for a child of God. These benefits will not change. They're fixed, ongoing benefits. That's why we read in Lamentations where it says, They're new every morning. Every morning when we wake up, these benefits and these blessings are fresh and new and available. Let's not forget all these benefits. Let's be grateful for them. Let's bless the Lord for them. And let's claim them in our lives. Because they're available for us now and throughout our lives. Praise God. I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters. And I pray that they would experience to the full these wonderful benefits that you've provided for your children. And Father, I pray right now, if there are those watching that don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray for them today. I pray that they would call on the name of Jesus. And I'm speaking to you right now. If you're here and, you, and you're, you're logged on and you've never made Jesus your Lord, it's so simple to do that. I want to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 10, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. Just call on Him right now. Just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash away my sin. Make me new on the inside. Save me. And be the Lord of my life. I put my trust in You today and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Now, if you logged on uh, with us today, if you, if you prayed that prayer, I want to ask you to contact us. Log on to our website and let us know that you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Also, if you go to our website and find out everything going on at City on the Hill Church, thank you for logging on today. God bless you. Have an awesome day. Hallelujah.